Right then guys, it's PSL here for the 14th episode in my Grand Prix World Series, Managing Stewart. Now this episode is going to be a bit different to the other ones because I'm recording this commentary about a month after I recorded the footage. It's been established that we've got very little hope of scoring a point at all in 1999. So quite frankly, this season is very boring to actually take part in as it's really just a transition season for us. But of course, the battle at the front is incredibly exciting. Alex Wirtz, the Arrows driver, is at the top of the Drivers' Championship, and Arrows are even leading the Constructors' Championship. However, McLaren, Benetton and Ferrari are all there with them. So it's a four-way fight for the Constructors' Championship and an eight-way battle for the Drivers' Championship. In this video, I will be going through the next seven races, so from the Monaco Grand Prix through to and including the Hungarian Grand Prix. Before we get into the races, I do want to go through the post-Spanish Grand Prix news, which I ran out of time to include in the previous episode. So Ferrari have signed a team-sponsored deal with Murano, i.e. Marlborough. Giancarlo Minardi rather harshly was awarded the Worst F1 Manager of the Month award, and Ken Tyrrell was given the much more prestigious Best F1 Manager award. The other thing I've been meaning to mention for a while concerns Chief Designers. As the start of the season, I mentioned that Rory Byrne had only signed a one-season-long contract with Prost. Now that was because I planned to start off the second episode in this season with me signing Rory Byrne for the year 2000. But as you can see, Rory Byrne signed a deal with McLaren. I know I'm showing this now, but Ron Dennis did the deal before the Brazilian Grand Prix, only the second round of the season. So in short, I wanted to sign Rory Byrne at the start of the second episode in 1999, but Ron Dennis beat me to it. Anyway, on to the new developments in the Formula 1 world, and more specifically, to our car. The improved performance clutch, which I finished designing just after the Australian Grand Prix, was finally manufactured as I only needed to produce three spare parts for the upcoming Grand Prix. So, for the 1999 Monaco Grand Prix, I decided to watch the qualifying session and the start of the race, just so we could get a look at the other team's cars in 1999. Anyway, since it is Monaco, I thought I would do something a bit special, and since it's a scripted video, it's more practical to watch the sessions compared to if it was a live commentated video. Anyway, in qualifying, Alex Wurz was the first driver to set a lap time, and he did a 1 minute 21.556 a time he never bettered despite doing more laps later on. Michael Schumacher was the second man to post a time, and even though I thought the top teams went out later on in the session and the backmarkers first just to get some TV time, it almost appears to be the opposite in this game. Anyway, Schumacher beat Wurz's time and shortly after that, Heinz Howard Frentzen in a Benetton went one better and took provisional pole. I didn't send my drivers out until 54 in-game minutes, or 21 real-life minutes, had passed. That's because I was waiting for the track to rubber in. But over the course of the entire qualifying session, the best line rubber had only gone up by 2 out of 5, and the track dryness by 2, as the weather conditions changed from overcast to dry. By holding our running until the end of the session, we did marginally better than usual. Takaki slotted into his usual position, being ahead of both Williams and Minardi's, but Deniz beat both Prost drivers in qualifying. That includes Mika Hakkinen, who even lost out to his rookie teammate by two thousandths of a second. But qualifying is one thing and the race is quite another, as Hakkinen's underlying skill usually comes through in the races and less so in qualifying. At the sharp end of the grid, Damon Hill took pole position, with Michael Schumacher, who improved on his initial time, finished in second, and ahead of Frentzen, Coulthard, Fizzy Keller, and Wurtz, who rounds off the top six, with Irvine and Magnussen being the slowest drivers from the top four teams. A Sauber driver yet again proved to be the best of the rest, and this time it was Shinji Nakano who earned that honour by beating Salo Alesi Tuero and his own teammate Emmanuel Collard. 
In the race, Jan Magnussen got a 10 second stop go penalty straight away for jumping the start. So it meant he pitted at the end of the first lap, which dropped into the back of the running order which, around Monaco especially, is a nightmare situation to be in. During the second lap, our two drivers had worked their way up to 12th and 15th respectively. However, Takaki's movement up the grid was quickly reversed as he lost the positions he made up before the end of the very same lap. On the fourth lap, it became clear that Johnny Herbert, in that god-awful Williams car, was holding the pack up as Deniz was several seconds ahead of Herbert and all the drivers who were caught up in his wake, including our other man Tora Takaki. Herbert was going so slowly that Jan Magnussen had caught up to the tail end of the field and even passed two drivers before even six short laps had been completed. After this point I decided to save around 70 minutes of my life by fast forwarding to the end of the race. In the end, David Coulthard led a McLaren 1-2 and let's not forget that David Coulthard is the team's driver number one. So I don't know whether Damon Hill was told to move out of the way for his teammate or whether he was given an inferior pit stop strategy, but Damon was quicker in qualifying, had the track position and finished only 4 seconds behind David. By being the second driver, Damon is required to follow the team's instructions, governing when he has to move over and let his teammate pass. It's strange that Damon is the number two given that he is the quicker driver and has more championship points. Anyway, behind the McLaren 1-2 was a Ferrari 3-4 with Michael Schumacher ahead of Fizzy Keller, and Ferrari have given their drivers equal status, so Michael definitely bested his teammate fairly and squarely. Alex Wurtz finished in 5th, and with Magnussen receiving his 10 second stop go penalty, as well as both Benetton drivers retiring under extremely strange circumstances, I mean Frentzen had an engine failure and the Mechachrome engine is meant to be the joint most reliable engine in use, and Irvine retired under unknown circumstances, all of that allowed Emmanuel Collard, who got the better of his Sauber teammate Shinji Nakano, who outqualified him, to score the final point from this Monaco Grand Prix. The Monaco Grand Prix may not have been successful for us out on track, but financially it was a triumph. We made $482,000 profit, which is impressive, but is made much more impressive by the fact we've still got this multi-million dollar loan we're paying off. If you remove loan repayments, we would have made about $1 million from just this one race. I'd recommend you sit down for this next section of the video because I'm about to go through the post-Monaco Grand Prix news. So Benetton signed a deal with Bridgestone, but who cares about that? Because Ferrari announced they will run with Mercedes-Benz engines next year. And McLaren, just like in my F1 Manager series, have jumped ship from Mercedes to Ford. Let's start with Ferrari, who have decided their own engines are so bad, they would rather partner up with their arch rivals, Mercedes. I don't know which I find harder to believe that Ferrari would want Mercedes engines, or that Mercedes would actually be willing to give Ferrari engines. Also, Ferrari have always manufactured and used their own engines. It's unthinkable that they would abandon using their own engines after having done so for almost half a century. The McLaren Ford deal isn't as crazy as I originally thought, because as it turns out, Mercedes didn't own any part of McLaren until the year 2000. But I would love to know Ron Dennis's reasoning for leaving the automotive giant that McLaren had been with for the past five seasons. Finally, for the post-Monaco news, I was voted as the worst F1 manager and Ron Dennis, even after the Ford engine announcement, was chosen as the best F1 manager. Just after the Canadian Grand Prix, we finished designing an improvement for this season's chassis. And this is big news for us. Last year, I think we performed at our best just after we upgraded our chassis, so... Basically, if even after this major upgrade we still perform badly, then this season is near officially a write-off for us. So into the Canadian Grand Prix and I'm back to just simming through sessions just for time reasons. 
Anyway, I see very little benefit to watching the sessions, not once you factor in how long it takes to do it properly. In qualifying, the usual drivers occupied the top 8 positions, but Benetton bookended that top group as Frenson took pole but Eddie Irvine finished down in 8th. McLaren have the best average grid slots, and Ferrari bested arrows although the quickest Ferrari driver, Michael Schumacher, and the slowest arrows driver, Jan Magnussen, were only separated by one and a half tenths of a second. Collard once again was the best of the rest, but Nakano was beaten by both Jordan and Tyrrell drivers and was just the head of both of my drivers. Yes, Deniz and Takaki beat both Prost drivers including Mika Hakkinen. Seemingly the chassis upgrade has allowed us to jump Prost. If that's truly the case then, in simple terms we're in the same position as we were last year. Last year we were the 8th quickest team, one ahead of Prost. That appears to be where we are now. The race started and ended with Heinzeld Frentzen at the front, and Irvine shot up the order to make sure that both Benetton drivers ended on the podium. Coulthard split the two Benetton drivers, Michael Schumacher finished behind his ex-teammate driving for his ex-team, Verts came home in 5th, and due to some big names from the top 4 teams disappearing, Jean Alesi snapped up the final championship point. Two drivers from the top four teams were tired, Damon Hill due to an accident, and Ford's Achilles heel reliability bit Magnussen's backside again. The final omission is Giancarlo Fisichella who was disqualified due to running an illegal traction control system. Finally, I couldn't really verify if we now have the 8th quickest car because both of our drivers were tired. In the Drivers' Championship, the top three drivers are separated by only three points, with Wirtz still leading the way, Coulthard second and Frentzen third after he scored the full ten points and Hill got none. However, Hill and Schumacher are still very much contenders, and Irvine, Fizzy Keller and especially Magnussen all have the car to compete at the front. McLaren's Constructors' Championship lead has extended to 14 points, but we've not even completed half the season and Arrows are still very much with them, Benetton are only one point further back, and you can never rule out Ferrari. Since we last read the news, Williams have agreed a team sponsorship deal with former McLaren backer East. Ferrari and McLaren both announced deals for the same area of the car at the same time, and this time it's even with the same supplier on the same terms. Specifically, the deal is a partnership with Bridgestone. After all the craziness earlier on concerning engine deals for next season, it was nice to see a bit of familiarity. Michael Schumacher extended his contract with Ferrari, so he will be with them for one more season at least. Finally, I for lack of a better word, won the worst F1 manager award for the second time in a row, whilst David Richards of Benetton got the manager of the month title. The game may not rate me highly, but I signed a deal with Mercedes so that we will run their engines next year. The Mercedes engine was the best one on the grid last year, and I still believe it to be the best even now. So signing a deal with them is great, especially as last season I don't think they would even have been willing to talk to us. Just before the French Grand Prix, I discovered that Goodyear had supplied us with a new and improved hard compound tyre. It's a big step forward and surpasses the original hard and soft compound tyres. That's all well and good, but the qualifying session was held in light rain conditions, so that upgrade did nothing for us during qualifying. As expected, the two wet weather masters of Damon Hill and Michael Schumacher were the two fastest drivers in qualifying, with Hill beating Schumacher. Jean Alesi surprisingly qualified in third, then it's both Benetton drivers, and then Shinji Nakano in sixth. Nakano was quicker than Fizzy Keller, Wurtz, Hakkinen and Coulthard. Deniz was just behind Coulthard in terms of position, but his best lap was a little over 6 tenths slower than DC's. Jan Magnussen had a really bad time as he finished all the way down in 13th, but he did better than Juan Minardi and both Williams drivers who all failed to set a lap time within 107% of Damon Hill's.
Yano truly did sneak inside the 107 percent time and with over 4 tenths of a second to spare. That shows just how well he did to drag that dog of a car around in a legal time. The race was held in not just dry but very dry conditions, meaning we can finally test our new dry weather tyres out. Once again the race results show that in this game the starting positions have very little to do with the finishing positions. Fizzy Color qualified in 7th but won the French Grand Prix and Jan Magnussen made up 11 places from the start to the end of the race to cross the line in 2nd. The Benetton swapped places and moved up 1 position as they both beat John Alacy who started in 3rd. Coulthard and Schumacher took the final points places but Esteban Tuero, the former Minardi driver and 2nd best current Jordan driver only finished seven and a half seconds behind Schumacher's Ferrari. Takaki beat his teammate and Hakkinen and just about finished inside the top 10. Damon Hill retired for the second race in a row and this time it was the near bulletproof Mercedes engine that let him down. Alesi also wasn't able to capitalise on his good starting position due to his own engine failure. And finally, three drivers retired due to personal mistakes. Collard, Marini, which is predictable, and Alex Wurtz, which is far from it. At the halfway point of the season, Frensen and Coulthard are tied at the top of the Drivers' Championship, with Wurtz only one point back and Schumacher and Hill are tied on 26 points, only six behind the leaders. Even Fizzy Keller, Irvine and Magnussen are working their way back into contention after this race's results. The Constructors' Championship is still as close as ever with McLaren leading both arrows and Benetton by 10 points, and Ferrari are only another 4 points further back. There was a drought of news stories after the French Grand Prix and even more so on interesting news items. The highlights are that Jordan have signed a deal with team sponsor Winfried, McLaren and Ferrari simultaneously announced that they have filled up all of their sponsor slots already, and finally Alain Prost was given the worst F1 manager title, and Jean Todd was awarded the best F1 manager honour. So now into the second half of the season with the British Grand Prix, and we may have hopped across the English Channel but the weather hasn't changed. It's another light rain qualifying session, and yet again Damon Hill took pole position with Michael Schumacher trailing him. Jean Alesi excelled again, and that's because his wet weather stat is 4 out of 5, which is the same as Mika Hakkinen's. Irvine, Coulthard, Frensen and Wurtz round off the top 8. Hakkinen proved he's good in wet conditions as he qualified in 10th, and it's much the same story with Jarno Trulli who qualified in 13th, in a Minardi, and that's thanks to his 3 out of 5 wet weather skill. That's ahead of Magnussen who qualified all the way down in 15th, Trulli's teammate Rosset who plainly only has a 1 out of 5 wet weather stat, as Rosset along with Villeneuve, Herbert, Marini and Takaki all didn't make the 107% speed requirement. However, the FIA allowed all of those drivers to race, Except Jacques Villeneuve who for whatever reason, the FIA refused to let him start the race. The story of the British Grand Prix turned out to be very similar to the French Grand Prix as the race was very dry yet again, and Fizzy Keller won his second race in a row, although this time he was followed by Frenton in second, Jean Alesi finished on the podium in his plucky Jordan, beating both arrows who were led by Magnussen who started 7 positions behind his teammate, yet finished ahead of him. Juan Pablo Montoya in his debut F1 season and in a Tyrrell finished ahead of Michael Schumacher who didn't even score a point despite starting in second place. Although at least he finished the race unlike both McLarens and Eddie Irvine. Both Coulthard and Irvine had a hydraulics issue and Damon Hill retired for the second race in a row and this time it was with an electronics failure. And I almost forgot to mention that Tuero was disqualified for running an illegal driver aid which, assuming a Lacey is also running it, that could explain his turn of pace recently. 
The Constructors' Championship has closed up as now only 5 points separates the top 4 teams. McLaren are still just about leading the way with Benetton and Ferrari tied in 2nd and Arrows are only 1 point behind the two Italian giants. Into the post-race news and finally Arrows have paired up with the team sponsor Red Bull. There are 7 team sponsors so naturally they pair up with the 7 best teams. Prost didn't score any points last year, hence how they lost their team sponsorship deal. Red Bull were the only team sponsor not sponsoring anyone, and they weren't interested in sponsoring us for next year. To be fair, Arrows did finish in 7th in the Constructors Championship last year. One place ahead of us, and they are so much quicker than us now. Ever since Red Bull turned us down, this deal was inevitable. Sauber are the third and final team to have signed an engine supply arrangement with Mercedes-Benz. That means the three teams to be running Mercedes engines in 2000 are Ferrari, Sauber and Stewart. I want to know who in Mercedes management approved of giving their amazing engines to three teams they should have no association with. Ferrari should be their rivals, Salba are basically just a Ferrari B team, and we're awful so why have Mercedes struck a deal with any of us? Never mind all three of us. Williams have signed a partnership deal with Ford for next season. That's a good move for both parties as I believe this poor season is just a blip for Williams. Williams will certainly benefit as the Mechachrome engine is basically an abandoned 2 year old Renault engine and will never really move forward. The Ford engine will. All the bad news seem to have something to do with me as all three of the sponsors I was speaking to, Bossini, Castrol and Danka, all signed deals with other teams. So I spent all of that time and manpower to secure funding from them, and it's all gone to waste. Maybe that explains why I was given the Worst Manager of the Month award again, whilst Peter Sauber was given the much more prestigious award. The only good news for us was that we met the requirements for a partnership deal with AGIP, meaning we will have AGIP fuel for the next three years at least. I just hope they produce some good fuels each year because if they don't, we're screwed. AGIP offered us a 3 year long deal and I had no say in how long the deal was. I had to either take it or leave it, and I'm not exactly in a position to leave it. Into Austria for the 10th round of the season and for the first time in a little while, we had a dry qualifying session. So the qualifying results were a little harder to predict, but Michael Schumacher still started the race on the front row of the grid. Fizzy Keller was beaten by Coulthard to prevent it being an all Ferrari front row, and both Benetton's and Wurtz round off the top six. Jean Alesi yet again had another fantastic qualifying session as he beat Damon Hill. Jan Magnussen qualified away down the order and not even inside the top 10. And finally, Alberto Marini was banned after qualifying for running an illegal driver raid. The race itself ended like this. It was a McLaren 1-2 led by David Coulthard with Eddie Irvine on the final podium spot. Esteban Tuero in the Jordan finished in 4th, Wurtz in 5th and then it's both Tyrrells importantly with Mika Salo in 6th place, scoring another point for the fledgling team, and Montoya just one race after he scored his first Formula 1 points, nearly scored another. Both of our drivers beat Mika Hakkinen, something which I didn't think I would say this early on in the series. The more notable drivers who failed to finish the race include Michael Schumacher and Jan Magnussen, who both made costly mistakes, and Alessi and Frentzen, who both had engine failures. Ricardo Rosset was disqualified from the race, which must mean Minardi have designed and manufactured a driver raid. That's impressive for the Minnow team with a micro budget, although it's backfired already just because they didn't run what they developed by the FIA. 
David Coulthard shot up to the top of the table after his race win, thereby passing Frinson and Wurtz. Damon Hill is up to 4th after finishing 2nd in the Austrian Grand Prix, meaning he's broken the long-standing deadlock he had with Michael Schumacher. McLaren's 1-2 means they have a sizeable lead over Benetton in 2nd, and Arrows in 3rd who have jumped past Ferrari to demote them into 4th place. The latest engine arrangement for next season is between the two Italian firms of Minardi and Ferrari. That's a shock announcement, well, once you forget the drama with Ferrari losing faith in their own engines. But Minardi haven't just struck any old deal with Ferrari, oh no. Minardi have signed a works deal with them. That means Ferrari will be paying millions of dollars to the most cash-strapped team on the grid, and Minardi will be Ferrari's top priority for new developments. Ferrari also did a deal with Tyrrell at the same time, so Ferrari will be supplying Minardi and Tyrrell next season. I can see how Minardi and Tyrrell benefit from these deals as Ferrari consistently produce good engines, and they'll be giving them away for free to Tyrrell and even funding Minardi, but if Ferrari have such little confidence in themselves to produce a good engine, then why should anyone else be even slightly hopeful? In other news, the hugely successful Arrows Ford partnership is set to continue for another year, and yet another potential sponsor, this time Universal, have quit negotiations with us. I have still yet to sign a deal with a cash sponsor all season, and now things are getting deeply concerning for our financial security. The only real hope for us is that whilst I go back and spend yet more time speaking to potential sponsors, I did get a TV advantage which I used in our negotiations with FedEx, just in the hope that I can actually get some extra sponsorship for next season. I was going to skip out on the qualifying results for the German Grand Prix, but it was a light rain qualifying session which, at Hockenheim more than at any other circuit, caused chaos. The usual suspects were at the front, with the exception being Shinji Nakano, who exceeded all expectations to qualify in fourth in his Mercedes-powered Sauber. Exceptionally, only 12 drivers qualified within 107% of Schumacher's pole time, the slowest of those being Deniz. Trulli, Tuero, Collard, Magnussen, Marini, Montoya and Takaki were all outside the 107% time, but were given permission by the FIA to race. The same leeway wasn't afforded to both Williams drivers of Johnny Herbert and Jacques Villeneuve, as well as to Ricardo Rosset in a Minardi, even despite the plainly exceptional qualifying session that took place. The race was run on a dry track, and Michael Schumacher converted pole position into a race win at his home Grand Prix. Jean Alessi has been deeply impressive recently, and his race results have just been getting better and better. He finished in 2nd place, beating Frenton in 3rd, Coulthard in 4th, and then it's Shinji Nakano in a Salva Mercedes in 5th. And then Mika Salo, driving for the plucky Tyrrell team, scored yet another point for himself and the team. In doing that, he beat Magnussen, Fizzy Keller, Collard, and Mika Hakkinen, who drives a Mercedes-engined car. Alex Verst finished all the way down in 12th. However, that's still higher up than both of our drivers, Eddie Irvine and Tuero, who all retired. But most annoyingly, Damon Hill retired yet again. Hill's finishing record this season is awful compared to his teammate Coulthard's. And I'm having deja vu just saying that. While we were racing in Germany, the two French organisations of Prost and Peugeot were striking up a works deal. I'm disappointed by this, as I predicted great things for Prost, and whilst that didn't come about this year, it so easily could have done next year. Maybe it still will, as Mika Hakkinen will still be with the team, and whilst Rory Byrne will be off to McLaren, Prost will still have one glorious season with a Rory Byrne chassis. Of course, Mercedes have already signed deals for three other teams, including us. 
so I might have prevented what may have been an unstoppable Pros team. Peugeot are a decent engine manufacturer, but they're not exactly on the same level as Mercedes. Once again, I've been named as the worst F1 manager of the most recent month, and Jean Todt has been named as the manager of the month, now that Ferrari have shot up from 4th to 2nd in the Constructors' Championship. Finally, before we head off to Hungary, here's a quick update on our sponsor negotiations. We still haven't filled up a single section of the deal completion bar on the Fiat deal, but on the FedEx deal, the one which I used a TV advantage on, the deal completion bar has shot up from zero chunks of completion to three. It was a dry qualifying session which wasn't very interesting or important considering how little relevance the qualifying results often have to the race results on this game. But what is interesting and relevant is that Jean Alesi was disqualified from the entire race weekend after qualifying. Esteban Tuero was disqualified during the British Grand Prix and I speculated that Jordan's latest and illegally run driver aid was the reason behind Alesi's recent turn of speed. This disqualification right here gives further evidence to that theory. The Hungarian Grand Prix was won by Michael Schumacher and his former team took the final two podium places with Frensen getting the better of Irvine. Coulthard finished in 4th and Jan Magnussen finished in 5th, splitting the two McLaren drivers as Damon Hill finished in 6th. Fisichella retired through his own mistake and Wurtz went out due to a mechanical failure. Salo, Collard, Montoya and Takaki round out the top 10. Salo and Montoya finishing on the edge of the top 6 shows that Tyrrell have rocketed up the order from 1998 to 1999. Last year they were on a par with Minardi and now they're a solid midfield team roughly on the same level as Sauber. And Sauber have a Mercedes engine which says a lot about either how well Tyrrell are doing or how extensively Sauber are underutilising their powerhouse of an engine. Only five other teams have scored points and it's still a four way fight for the Constructors Championship. Arrows have fallen away back, but that's more due to a lack of reliability than a lack of pace. With four races still to run, Arrows, Benetton, Ferrari or the current leaders McLaren could enter the season as champions. The Drivers' Championship is now even closer as Frenson and Coulthard are tied at the top with 48 points each. Michael Schumacher trails them by only two points, with Wurtz, Hill and Fizzy Keller all within 20 points of the leaders. Mathematically, even Jean Alesi could win the championship, and with his recent run of form, I'd hardly say it's impossible. But with only four races left, it is unlikely. So that's everything for this episode, and the final two episodes in this season will be a return to normality with the usual unscripted two races per episode format. This season is incredibly interesting as no team or driver has really been consistently winning races or finishing on the podium. The driver who's come closest to that is Frentzen, but he's also had reliability on his side. The same can't be said for Wurt and Hill, who have both been blisteringly quick, but prone to finishing races early. That's what makes this season's Drivers and Constructors Championships so tough to call. And I hope you'll join me for the final four races in 1999 to see who wins the season as a world champion.